going to have a chat to uh, Peter Williamson right now. But just before I do, I'll just give you a little bit of a profile of Peter. And uh, Peter is one, well, he's uh, one of the very top line drivers from the 70s and 80s and uh, probably the 60s when he started. But uh, back in 1979, Peter, together with Channel 7, came up with the idea of an in-race car camera, putting the viewer in the driver's seat with some colourful commentary and great TV footage. In-car cameras are now standard TV all over the world. Some of Peter's other great achievements include appearances in five Australian Grand Prix, fifth place in the Sawan Gore Grand Prix in Malaya, first outright for Toyota in the 1981 Manufacturers Championship, third outright in the 1980 Australian Touring Car Championship, and first outright in the Goodridge Challenge National Under Three Litre Championship. And of course, Peter also won his class in the three or four uh, Bathurst races. So uh, Peter has an illustrious career, and I'm fortunate enough to have Peter in the studio with me now. Good morning, Peter. Morning, Chris. How was that build-up? Was it pretty accurate, mate? Was yeah, it three, yeah, three or yeah, four races? Yeah, about 400 things left out, but apart That's from right, yeah, well, we, I can't <laughs> stay here till midnight reading them all out, you see. <laughs> yeah. Was it three or four class wins? Uh, th- four. four. Four, was it, right. Yeah. Well, I've got a few questions for you, and you were sort of pondering over them, so I might ask you a few, and then we, we might just talk a little bit about the in-car camera, because that really is quite fascinating. How did you get started in motorsport? What actually led you into it, and what was your first car? Well, uh, when I was young, motor cars were quite a mysterious device and 68 mile an hour flat out in a hole in FJ was quite thrilling. <laughs> um, I had schoolboy friends. Uh, I used to ride horses in shows and I used to compete against Ian and Ian, Pete Gagan and Leo Gagan, even on horses. And we all grew up together in Liverpool. Uh, Barry Seaton, Glenn Seaton's father. Uh, there were the Algae boys from Wollongong who probably would be remembered by some. And uh, there was a lot of guys in our town who were pretty keen um, on motor cars and with the Gagans starting in motor racing uh, in s- and being so uh, so illustrious uh, we naturally we used to gather firewood for old Tom Gagan and uh, it sort of was just a it was just a thing that grew on us all and uh, we sort of was a natural thing really because most kids in those days uh, just a ride in a car was just a, you know an unbelievable <laughs> thing um, my first race car w- was after a few little touring car things we did in rallies and stuff like that. It was a Buckle Coupe, a car built by Bill Buckle, of, um, who used to build Goggomobiles, if anyone would remember that. And uh, he powered it with a Zephyr engine and uh, it was a fiberglass coupe. It was styled basically on the AC Ace, an English sports car that David Mackay brought out here to and, and set one of the Australian land speed records in his class and it was a very, very successful vehicle. Uh, the first race I had with that was I took it to Lowood. You had to do that in those days. It was only it's like a circuit in each state. And uh, we drove up to Lowood in Queensland overnight. We broke 11 windscreens over the weekend and drove home on Sunday night and that was how you did it. All right, well, I mean... I. I asked you off air, and uh, this got you scratching your head just a little bit. You've had a lot. You had a long career in motorsport. What was your high, What would you say was your highlight, or was one of your highlights? I mean, we well, probably well, can't put them all in. Well, the the biggest highlight has to be running third outright in the Australian Touring Car Championship to people like Brock um, and a two liter Celica. I mean, say what you might, uh, it, that's a f- fairly significant uh, result. I mean, it was it was over a series, and which was. You know, we had to have, be, because of the point structure, if you ran outright, you got a lot more points than the guys who won their class. So we had to maintain our class wins all around the country for a year, and we had to run fairly high up in the in the outright order to get some points. I think they only gave outright points back to fifth place. So, so to run third outright against all those sort of people in V8 cars and so forth was, to my mind, a, f- a fairly significant thing to do. I think the other highlight um, would have to be, I suppose, uh, uh, I think we, we were, f- what did we do best in Bathurst? I think 8th outright in Bathurst was a highlight. Uh, you know, it was a pretty hard thing to do in a little tiny car. We did it through good planning. Uh, we were cleverer than everybody else. I was pretty proud of my team. They 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 worked everything out to the umph degree and we did it on, on just cleverness rather than anything else. Um, I think another highlight was beating Barry Seaton in the, in the Ansett uh, Trophy Race at Oran Park. We had a wonderful, uh, wonderful burn for a long, long way, and uh, in he and his uh, Capri, 
I got him on the second last lap and it was a wonderful highlight. I, I, it was probably the best motor race I've ever driven. Um, the other highlight, 30 laps racing against Derek Bell at Bathurst in the Auto Delta Alpha in our Celica. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a man, um, I think, probably the the greatest driver. I, I know you're going to ask me this, Chris. So I think he's probably the best driver I drove against or with. We were wheel to wheel at Bathurst and, um, and uh, Derek gave me plenty of room and in the finish he just waved me past and I thought, well, there you go. And he was, you were driving a Saluka, weren't you? Yes, at stage, yeah. yes. And, and in those days in the Saluka, everyone poo-pooed the car. They, they didn't realise that we were in a GT with a twin cam. They all thought it was, was their wife's Saluka that we were driving around in, you know. <laughs> well, you, you answered the next question uh, because you said you thought Derek Bell was the best driver you ever saw. What well, about not locally? Saw, but I think against. Against, right. Yeah. Well, what about locally? Who was your best driver oh, I, I locally? Think, I think uh, as a gentleman and as a driver, and particularly as a driver, it has to be Peter Brock. I mean, uh, um, he was he's won so much, and you can't do that on luck. No, I mean, no, no. Whatever you say. Great driver. We might move on to the camera now, because I think that, I mean, uh, people don't realise, but I mean, it was your pioneering efforts that actually saw in-car cameras, and now they're in bikes, and they're in everything, and uh, the, you've got some pretty good stories about that original camera, about the size of it, about the technology needed to actually run it. Uh, would you mind recounting those for us, Peter? Well, a lot of things came together that year. The, the Moscow Olympic Games, they developed a camera manufactured by an American firm, HCF Thompson. Can I just uh, break in? This was 1979, wasn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah, well, the Miss Moscow Olympics caused that, uh, like all these things caused things to be had to happen. Um, and a fellow working with Channel 10, uh, John Porter, an Irishman, he had this idea. It, it, it wasn't difficult to get a, 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 a video out of a car. That, that wasn't the difficult part. The difficult part was getting video and audio out of a car together, um, and uh, that that was the technical problem that, that that everybody faced. And with the advent of this uh, this the, the Moscow Olympic technology, and put in our car, and after three months of testing, and you know you, they had to, they had to mount the camera and the, and the equipment so that it didn't vibrate, as a consequence of the engines. Uh, uh, you know, it's the frequencies in the car through the engine. There was a lot of work put into that. Uh, a lot of work put in to try and get power out of the car without having, you know, hundreds of kilograms of equipment in the vehicle. That was where the technology came in, and uh, this fellow was quite brilliant. Um, it was really down to three people, me, him, and his side, side, side man, um, and the helicopter pilot, and it took a long, long time uh, to get it sorted. Uh, nobody knew, because it was sort of not really refined the first time at Bathurst, nobody knew in our crew that it was going to work until we did the first warm-up lap and we turned the thing on and they said, uh, Porter, I could see him running down the hill. He was up in the middle of the mountain there in a, in a hole in the ground and he came running down yelling out, we've got a picture, we've got a picture. Uh, yippee do, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he said, "Look, we got a bit of a problem. It's it's rained, and there's water on the leaves as you go around certain parts of the circuit." He named the parts of the circuit. He said, "When you go around there, I want you to lean over, turn that button on, and and just adjust the iris to the right <laughs> a quarter of a turn. And then when you clear that castral curve or whatever, you do it do it in reverse." So because apparently the water on the leaves was interfering with the signal and we had to power it up somehow. This is why you're travelling at 160 kilometres an hour yes. across the top of the mountain. Yeah, this, and this all happened. Well, sounds easy, We're on it? the grid with the engine running and this is the, this is the instructions I'm getting. Anyway, it all turned out wonderfully and uh, we lost audio uh, between myself and the pit uh, what, not very far into the race and the brilliant part of it was that I, that I respect Gary uh, Wil Wilkinson and... Uh, and uh, all those people in the in the in the um, sports broadcasting, uh, the way they handle things, they I didn't know that anything. All I knew that they told me when the helicopter was in 500 feet of me, talk. <laughs> and uh, what they were doing, they were ad libbing me, and I and they would say as I, they'd sort of half guessed what I was going to say, and they'd ask me a, a qu silly question, and and of course not knowing anything, I'd see the helicopter fly over, and, and I, then I'd start talking away or doing my best. So it wasn't uh, actually two-way communication? Not in that race, okay. no. no. And it, it pit signals, my pit crew, but no television. Uh, we lost it. Right. Okay. And if you look, ever saw those things, they're quite corny and hammy, but the background is such that I think it was a brilliant effort by them, you know. Now, now in the era of uh, cameras which probably weigh, you know, 
below a kilogram in weight these days, well below a kilogram. You said that one way around. What, about 60 pounds, you said? Oh, you? I was about 64 pounds, I think. Uh, we were allowed to remove our seat, passenger seat, as a compensation. We didn't really get 100% of the weight back from, from the carrying it, but but uh, they did allow us to remove the passenger seat. In those days, you had to w- carry the, the, the genuine trim in the car. You know, you yeah, couldn't sure. drive without it and... Uh, and uh, the cars look pretty nice inside, but they allowed us to do that, and I think the boot mat and a couple other little things. Yeah. So let me give it this straight. Uh, being in the car as a driver, handling a car around Bathurst and doing, you know, 100 and 120, 130 mile an hour or 250 k's or 230 k's down Bath- down Conrod and, say, 200 over the top of the mountain there, you had to look for the helicopter and adjust the camera at the same time. Yeah, the, in the, <laughs> in the, yeah early in the day we had to adjust the camera. Uh, yeah, and it was good fun, you know. It was... Um, uh, you, you, it's a discipline, and yeah. uh, and I just thought how w- before the race I thought how if this thing works how am I going to handle this? So I just thought of up all the all the one-liners that I've learned all my life, and <laughs> I just dealt with it with one-liners, and it seemed to come out okay. And there is some great, there's great, and that's still available the videotapes of that race with with Peter's commentary, and uh, you did a very good job, mate. And they did a good job of talking to you when they weren't really sort of Clayton's talking to you, weren't they? Oh yeah, it was brilliant <laughs> actually. Yeah. Well, look. As a final question, I mean, you're in motor racing for a lot of time. What advice would you give somebody just starting off in motorsport today? I mean, it's a different ball game because of sponsorship and because of the costing factor. It's enormous now. So what advice as somebody that's been in a long while would you say to somebody? Well, firstly, most young people look at supercars and that's probably what they think. But I think personally supercars and the professionalism of it and the huge amount of money being put into it by Ford and Holden to keep these people going is a bit of a shame because when when we started there were several categories of motor racing there were open wheelers sports cars sedan cars and and I think people were more interested uh, as a general rule um, so today you, you you've got to forget the crowds and uh, and I believe there's only one place that you learn to car control you learn how to set up a car and understand how to what makes a car go around corners and how to adjust things is definitely Formula Ford. Young Spichala, Wally Spichala's young boy, I see is very active in Formula Ford with Wally's support, and uh, they're having a ball, and uh, and he's going very well. And I, I dare say now he's a lot wiser guy than he was this time last year, as far as mo- mechanics are concerned. Uh, and I think that's the place to go. The, the Formula Ford is a simple vehicle; it's almost a standard engine. And uh, I don't think there's any other... Mind you, there's no crowds, sure, but uh, uh, I think that's the best place for you. Well, mate, thank you very much for taking the time to come all the way over from Foster to talk to us today. And uh, it was super interesting. And on behalf of all the motor racing fans all throughout the world, thank you for your pioneering efforts in the in-car camera. It was, uh, we certainly all appreciate that now because we can actually watch the race from the driver's seat almost. Thank so you. thank you again for coming over and uh, and joining Mon Rima on the road today and all the very best for the for the future, Peter. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure.
the real innovations this year will be the means of putting you right into the driver's right seat. There. Well, not in the seat, but next to the driver. To explain how it's going to happen, it's back to Mike Raymond. Thank you very much, Evan. Well, we're very, very proud of our Channel 7 telecast each year from Mount Panorama that we can bring you something different, something that's a little extra for you. And, of course, last year, uh, our magnificent uh, coverage uh, with the um, Colour 7 helicopter which brought you some tremendous uh, shots. Uh, this year, of course, uh, our uh, technical experts have uh, been hard at work for the past few weeks developing a camera which we can put into a car and a uh, special arrangement with the Australian Racing Drivers Club that is actually participating in the event. This is it, the great race. Moffat has made a brilliant start, he's flying and Brock is going and here they come to that critical first bend. We have a touch off in the Hardy Ferrado Classic for 79 with Peter Brock 0-5 for the Mulder Holden dealer team. Zooming up Mountain Straight, right behind him Bobby Morris, Alan Moffat has advanced from 4th to 3rd and Alan Bryce and here is our camera view in the Peter Williamson car in the small leader class. This is what it feels like in the opening corner and the first run to Mountain Straight. Peter Williams, in the meantime, trying to uh, press the top of the mountain to get through some of these slower cars, not making any uh, spectacular manoeuvres in this opening lap because the drivers really don't know if anything goes wrong, what's ahead of them. The master in front, weaving across the road, the adrenaline pumping, 60 drivers out there all trying their hardest. Well, this is what it feels like, folks, in the first lap with all this traffic coming over the top of the mountain. Peter Williamson right on the tail of a Tirana that isn't running as quickly as Peter Williamson would like to run. Now, the open spaces, the wide open territory of Conrad Strait, and it's all out, all the way. Okay, Conrad Strait, this is what it feels like coming down, going through the gears, the brakes as we approach the left-hander. Derek Bell alongside him in the Alpha, but just being slightly out -break. so we've got a great dice on for the two-litre cars, they're running neck and neck, you can see the Alpha just slipping inside him there. Coming along the pit straight, then turning left into Avco Mountain Straight, and here we go with the Alfetta. Peter Williamson going through the gears on his approach to the run up the mountain. Frank Porter driving the Alfetta just in front of him, it'll be a great dice between these two makes, as well as the Derek Bell car, which qualified a little earlier, so he's out in front. And Williamson has the power in the Toyota. Now the right-hander, GTX Ben coming up. And the first car in the pitch, by the way, it's car number 40, the RX-7 Mazda of Terry Shield. Now the short straightaway as we take the left-hander of BP Cutting, the child world care sponsored corner. Another car in the pitch, car number 48, just crawled in. That's the uh, Barry Lee Mazda RX-3. And the leading 10 at the end of that first lap as we sit with Peter Williamson climbing the mountain. It's Brock, Morris, Moffat, Grice, Charlie O'Brien, Peter Jansen, Gary Rogers, Johnny Harvey. And that's the difference in power. That's as a big Falcon goes by. Johnny Harvey's in eighth place. We have uh, Dick Johnson from Queensland in ninth and Gary Cook in tenth. They're the top ten. Just about where we are now is where uh, John Goss stacked his Falcon during practice earlier in the week, but that's him you can see moving along ahead of Peter Williamson's Saliga at the moment. The KTL sponsored Falcon back on the track and racing with John Goss at the wheel. Just watch though how Peter Williamson will close up on the big four down through this top part of the circuit. You often hear commentators referring to how these smaller class cars can uh, can make up ground. Well, you notice Goss as soon as he gets on to uh, to Conrad straight away will move away, but through this particular part of the circuit. Peter Williamson has moved right up on the bumper of the KTL Ford, driven by Johnny Goss. And uh, let's take a look back at our camera car. This is the Peter Williamson Toyota Celica. And this is what it feels like to come down the mountain. He's going to make an approach here. Up with the Escort, the uh, Capris, as you can see there, running in a bigger class. These are three-litre cars, and they should pull away from him as they go down the straight, but that's where Peter Williamson is. All cars taking the exact apex and a little bit more, almost cutting the grass there. And now the bigger three-litre V6s showing just a slight advantage in legs, but it'll be interesting to see whether Peter Williamson can close up under braking at the end of, of 
Breville straight. What could be a thrill for our viewers later is to see one of these Fords or Tiranas then pull out and go past to see the, just the speed difference.